Krishnan, there's been a lot of talk of the fighting slowing down over the winter, but that's not what we've seen in Donetsk over the last few days. And President Zelensky said overnight that this is the most active battlefront at the moment. In the town of Bakhmut, there is street fighting. Across the steppe, the agricultural land, there are artillery duels. There are machine guns active all the time. And as we found out in the trenches with Ukrainian soldiers, Russian snipers as well. Not the Somme, but Donetsk. Not 1916, but now in the 21st century. Ukrainian soldiers trudging through the splashing mire of the trenches. This is how it will be all winter, through rain and sleet and snow, inches of territory lost and gained. Enemy for 500 meters of our... So the enemy is just yeah. 500 meters yeah. away? Yes. That's not very far? Yeah. <laughs> a bit too close for comfort. Yeah. Every soldier have, yeah. have his fighting place. Vadim shows me a firing position. So it's early on. And fight. And fight, yeah. yeah. If we have artillery fight for us, we have... The soldiers rotate every two and a half hours and at times get barely any sleep. We have superpower. You have su What's your yeah. superpower? I'm Ukrainian. <laughs> the commander leads us further into the warren. And tells us we have to run across a stretch of open ground left so tanks can pass between trenches. The trees have shed their leaves so there's no cover. We can hear outgoing machine gun fire. In the deepest part of the trench, it's always night. How are you? And even the shortest soldier has to bend down to avoid cracking his head. Yuri shows me the location of an observation point and where the machine gunner stands. The Ukrainians don't just want to push the Russians back, but also to get them to waste manpower and ammunition. By now, the outgoing fire was getting intense and there was incoming too as we were trying to leave. We've just heard sniper fire overhead. That was after all the outgoing from the Ukrainian machine guns. So we're just going to stay down here for a bit. So we wait, listening. The outgoing machine gun fire from the Ukrainians is aimed at suppressing the Russians so they don't fire back. But the problem is that as long as there's firing from this position, there could be firing coming into us. And that's why we're waiting here in this trench and not moving. Three, two. After a few minutes of quiet, it's time for us to run across the open ground to the other trench. All safe.
and now down into the safety of the soldiers' sleeping quarters, which are warm and cosy, a necessity not a luxury, because they need to keep kit dry. And Vadim has a companion. We have friend. <laughs> No. Olyenka, the kitten, is just two months old. She is a good warrior. She's a good yeah. fighter. Mouse. Oh, she gets the mice. Yeah, yes. Do you have a problem yes. with mice in yes. the trench? No, we our place in the field. Yeah. It's filled many mice. And so, and and are your, do you have a wife? Vadim thinks of the Netherlands where he worked before the war, and of his girlfriend who's in the Czech Republic. If we win, mm. I stand in Ukraine. Make a family. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You'll make your life yeah. here. My children live in the freedom country. Life in Ukraine will be tough this winter and nowhere tougher than the trenches of Donetsk. The risk is only too clear. But Ukrainian soldiers know why they're fighting and what they must endure to win. It's perfectly possible that this trench warfare is going to continue through the winter without either side making any notable advances. And, you know, here in the background right now, even in Kramatorsk, I can hear the rumble of artillery. It's not clear how far away it is. Now, there's a NATO meet, foreign minister's meeting tomorrow, and what they're going to concentrate on is the other threat, which are the, is the Russians who are firing missiles at Ukraine's energy sector. That's the reason that so many towns in Ukraine don't have power and some of them still don't have water. A lot of places, they haven't managed to restore that yet. So what NATO countries are likely to do is provide more air defences, as well as generators and transformers, other things that will make civilians' lives just that little bit less difficult. I can't say easier over the winter. But even as that is going on, the men you saw in that report, Vadim, Yuri and others, are going to be in those trenches fighting. And so are the Russians. The Russians who are their equivalents, many of them conscripts, the poor bloody infantry, and their kit may be worse and they may have less discipline. And discipline is one of the things you need to survive a winter in the trenches. Now, in 2022, just as it was more than 100 years ago in another part of Europe. Lindsay Hilson reporting with her team Josh Ho, Rob Hodge and Maxon Drabok. For the visually impaired, a dubbed version of that report will be online shortly. And with more on Ukraine, over to Fatima. Thanks. Well, joining us now is Liam Collins, who was the founding director of the Modern War Institute at West Point, and he served as a defence advisor to Ukraine. Um, Mr Collins, this scenes of trench warfare, the bleakness, it evokes memories or scenes from the First World War. How sustainable is it? Yeah, I mean, it's normal for soldiers, right? That in times when things slow down, you always dig trenches, you dig uh, fighting positions really to survive artillery and, and drone attacks that they have now. So uh, it's sustainable. This is anticipated. This is predictable. And in a war that's going to last many months and years, we're going to see it shift back and forth between large scale maneuver operations and then slow downs where they're digging trenches. Do you think we will see soldiers freezing to death on both sides, perhaps? If the temperatures get down cold enough, I think there's that possibility, but I, I don't think it's going to be, it, that's really probably not going to happen. They're, they're close enough to pull them off the, off the front lines, warm up where they have to. Uh, you're not going to see them freezing, but you will see cases of frostbite and, and those kind of things. Mm. And in your analysis, how do the conditions compare for the Russian soldiers on the opposing side? Yeah, without a doubt, however bad it is for the Ukrainians, it's worse for the Russian soldiers. Uh, most of them are conscripts, little training, little discipline, poor leadership. They don't have a non-commissioned officer corps. Uh, and so they really don't, they're just kind of thrown out into these trenches with no training or experience and trying to survive out there. And, and the Ukrainians we've, Ukrainians, we've seen they're better armed, um, better trained, better disciplined, and that helps you survive the harsh conditions. So it, it will definitely be extremely difficult for the Russians when the temperature starts dipping lower. And on that subject of arms, how much of this conflict is essentially going to be an arms race? Um, essentially, how quickly each side can build up its weaponry, for, for the Russians obviously developing it themselves, but for Ukraine, how quickly Western countries can get weapons to Ukraine? 
Yeah, I mean, it's really just a matter of how long the war will go on, as you said. It, it's not necessarily an arms race. It's, I think it's just going to be a war of attrition, and eventually the Russians will be fatigued. They just won't be able to. It'll be so costly, they just won't be able to continue fighting anymore. We'll choose not to. And I think that's many months or years away where the Ukrainians, they're not going to quit, right? They, they have the will to continue. Uh, they performed well. So as long as they're able to resupply, uh, they're going to continue to fight, and we've seen how their performance has gone up earlier in the conflict when the missile strikes were hitting the cities. They were only shooting down about 20 to 25 percent of those Russian missiles. Now that's over 70 percent. So we've seen just in the last few months how, how much that, that, that those new arms and ammunition have helped them. Uh, and we saw that nuclear talks between Russia and the U.S. have been postponed this week. What's the significance of that, and what implications does it have in terms of any other negotiations around Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it really affects negotiations around Ukraine. I think most of those, it's good to have that that the openness and communications for negotiations, but neither side, there's no overlapping agreement that can be reached. Russia's not going to just quit with what they have, and Ukraine's not going to allow Russia to keep the territory that it currently has, because if we saw after eight years, they never got the Donbass back. So Ukraine's not going to enter any agreement that allows Russia to keep territory. And as of right now, Russia's not going to into an agreement that doesn't allow them to keep territory. So that's why it's going to drag on, and, and most of these negotiations aren't going to lead anywhere. Okay. Liam Collins, thank you very much for joining us tonight.